morning, church. We welcome you to praise and sing to our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We rejoice in the Lord for he is good. Yeah? Oh, we can't hear you out there. Is he good? Yay! And there's a light that shines with hope and grace fills the sky. With the mercy each day will rely. Let your glory pour out. the joy that overwhelms our souls because we know our God is in control. Oh, the flow, let your favor pour out. Jesus, and we sing. And this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We'll rejoice, we'll rejoice.
promise keeper. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for loving us and for always seeing us. Thank you for never forgetting us, never forsaking us. You have been faithful our whole lives, God. When we look back over, we see you, God, and we thank you for it. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All of my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my hand I will sing of the goodness of God Has he been good to you? All my life you have been faithful So, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice, come on I love your voice You have led me through the fire You have led me through yeah. the fire
Hallelujah, Jesus. And God, we worship you for your goodness. Your goodness never runs out. And so our response is worship and adoration to you. Our response is worship and adoration to you. And so before we go into another song and sing about his goodness, we're going to adore our king. So lift up your voice to the Lord. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Lord, you are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of our praise. We give like oil to you and we sit at your feet, God. You are good. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We love you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, God. We love you, Jesus. And your love has stayed the same in your constant grace remains the cornerstone and things that we thought were dead they're breathing in life again and you cause your sun to shine on darkest nights oh for all that you've done we will pour out our love this will be our anthem song we sing in Jesus we
Hallelujah, Lord, we do love you this morning. Could you all help me just press in for a moment? I believe that our miracle is very close. God's presence is in this place. Could we express our affection, our emotion to God for just a minute? Lord, this moment, we just praise you. Lord, you have our affection. You have our emotion, Lord. And we love you because your word says that we love you because you first loved us. And we thank you, Lord, for that love. And we pray that not only that love would transform us, but it would transform our communities. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, church family, I just want to encourage you this morning. I know that sometimes we come here from Sunday to Sunday not fully expecting that miracle. But I feel that this morning we're, we're about this close from running into that miracle that God has for you. Some of us have come in here just thinking, man, all I have to offer God today is just a, a broken hallelujah. I'm not sure if things are going to change by the time I get home. And I'm here to remind you that God heard your prayer this morning. I'm here to remind you that God heard you worshiping. And it's in that place that you're going to find freedom. Well, good morning, CLC. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to tell somebody you didn't have to come out here in the snow, but I'm glad that you did. Go. Good morning. My name is Moy. I'm one of the pastors on staff. I'm also the director for the Hope Center. I just want to welcome everyone this morning. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning, especially considering the weather conditions. But if anybody's here for the first time, could you help me give them a special warm CLC welcome? Whether you're here joining us in person or online, thank you so much. We're honored that you would spend your Sunday morning with us. And we'd like to ask you to pull out your phone at this moment. We want to get better acquainted with you. Uh, you could pull out your phone and text the word NEW to 833-420-1244. That's 833-420-1244. That's just one of the ways that we could get better acquainted with you and you could get better acquainted with us. Following the service, I'll give you uh, some special instructions. You could meet us out in the loft. Well, CLC, you know why you're seeing me here this morning? Because it's Mission Sunday. And these pretty flags up on the top are just another reminder that our church is missionally minded. Not only are we crazy about what God's doing around the world, but we're also passionate about what God's doing here locally. And just a few testimonies for you guys. If you guys have not checked us out on our Facebook page, we have our 1,200 square foot greenhouse up. Now, why is that so important? Blue Island and Robins are food deserts. We're doing something serious in the area of tackling food insecurities. 50% of our produce goes back out into the community. The other 50% helps us teach our community how to market food products. What's that greenhouse going to help us do? That greenhouse is going to help us harvest all the way up until the 1st of January. Yeah, where everybody stops harvesting in October... We have three more months of grace. Can anybody say grace? grace? So if you haven't, stop by, check, check it out while you're there. Say hi to our chickens. Grab some fresh eggs for your, for your breakfast the following morning. God is doing great things at the Hope Center. And that's not it. We went from a 200 square foot room with our hydroponic machines now to a 2,000 square foot room downstairs in a basement with seven machines. Each one of our seven machines grows 25 pounds of vegetables in 28 days. Wow. Wow. Northwestern is uh, uh, partnering with us. They're offering their students $5,000 in tuition assistance to join our team and to help us 
multiply our efforts so that we can have more impact in the community. <laughs> Guys, thank you. Thank you. It's through your generosity. It's through your faithful giving. It's through your belief that we are a missions-minded church and that we love not only what God is doing across the world, but also here locally. And it's great, but you know what's even better? The conversations, the spiritual conversations that we're having is we're helping people find hope in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the best part of what we're doing. When people become to get curious and say, why are you doing this? Just like Jesus met that woman at the well. Why are we talking about water? Why are you giving me water? Jesus is like, look, I'm here to give you the living water. And you could continue to help us impact the community with your faithful giving. And there's three ways you could do that through the app, the website, clc.tv slash give. You could text CLC Tinley to 77977 or use a lot of the conventional boxes that we have here located in the, in the back. Well, at this moment, I'd like to turn your attention to the screens for some further announcements. Good morning and welcome to Sunday Worship Experience at Christian Life Center. My name is Nia Maioli, a young adult here and an attendee for about six years. Currently, I serve in life students on the worship team. It is my pleasure to bring you the latest opportunities and updates within our community. We are a church family full of intentionality. Therefore, those of you visiting for the first time, whether in person or online, we want to get to know you better. Just text the word NEW to 833-420-1244 and our church life team will be in contact with you. By the way, as you exit the sanctuary, please visit our loft area where there will be a gift of appreciation for joining us today. It's in the area with all the poinsettias. Do you recall me mentioning that we are a church of intentionality? That's right. We consciously create environments that foster community, growth, and development. Therefore, we invite you to join Growth Track. Not only does Growth Track make you an official member, but it also further develops your personal leadership, it fine tunes your God-given gifts, and then it propels you to make a difference in the lives of others by serving the community. Come join our four-week Growth Track course held on the first four Sundays of the month. For further details, text GROWTH to 708-998-4516. Hey, my life students, junior high peeps. You are free to dismiss yourselves to join pastors Harry and Crystal, plus the captains for your discipleship services. I hear that you guys will be discussing about generosity. Are you wanting to be baptized? If so, we are in open arms of being a safe haven for you to take that new leap of faith. As a youth, I recall being taught that the visual testimony really is an indication to the world that we are accepting God as our Lord and our Savior. Plus, that we all are now united with Him in His death, burial, and resurrection. Now, this doesn't mean that we will be perfect moving forward, but it does mean that we acknowledge the Holy Spirit in everything we do. Sign up for baptisms by texting BAPTISM to 708 998 4516. All right, church, we are in a new series, and this one is very fitting as our last sermon series of the year. It's called Peaks and Valleys. For week one, the subject is valleys. Week two is plateaus, and the final week is peaks. Our pastors felt as though it would be beneficial to acknowledge how far we all have come, and no matter what, God has carried us through it all. That really makes me think of Isaiah 54 10, where it reads, For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. <sighs> wow, that is so reassuring. But look, on that last week of peaks, December 10th, you will definitely want to be in the building, as we will commemorate our journeys together as a church. Last thing, Christmas Eve service this year will be at 9 and 11 a.m. And New Year's Eve services are Sunday at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Plus an end of the year worship celebration at 10 p.m. Thank you guys so much for being a part of our church family. And we're so excited to see what God has in store for us this week. Stay up to date on all things CLC by following us on social media at We Are CLC Tinley on Instagram and Facebook. Please prepare to hear from one of our founding pastors, Chris McQuay, as she introduces the series, Peaks and Valleys. Be blessed.
It's so good to see you. You made it through the snow and the holidays. Uh, and for those of you who couldn't make it with us, those of you who are online, thank you for joining us. I know that there's family coming and going, and of course, uh, family's still around, and snow, and a lot of reasons why you might be joining us line. We just want you to know that you're very welcome, and thank you for joining us. Uh, today, as you heard, we're going to be starting a new series called Peaks and Valleys. And uh, I think it's going to be a blessing to us all. Now, I love mountains. How many know that about it? Yeah, my husband and I, we go to the Smoky Mountains every year. But I don't just love, you know, the physical mountains. I love mountain experiences. Do you know what I mean? You know, when there's victory, you've accomplished your goals. Hallelujah. Uh, you paid all the bills, and there's still some money in the bank. <laughs> and there's just, you know... Things are going good. We love those times, especially because you feel, you know, so close to God. What's not to love, right? Now, you're, you're not in a turkey coma, are you? <laughs> I, turkey comas, raise your hands. Okay, we do have a couple. <laughs> but even though I love mountains, we're not going to start with mountains. We're going to actually uh, go from peaks. We're going to start with the valleys. Now, we all love mountains, and none of us are too fond of the valley experiences, are we? You know, but they are a part of life. I dare say that everyone here has either just gotten over a valley, you're presently in a valley, or you're going to start one this afternoon. <laughs> Because you know, none of us are exempt, none of us are immune, all of us face problems and struggles and challenges. I do, and you do as well. So, you know, one of the problems with valleys is that God feels so very, very far away. He feels like he's a thousand miles away. But nothing could be farther from the truth because God is not just a God of the peaks. He is a God of the valleys. In 1 uh, Kings chapter number 20, the Syrian king was, said, was told, you know, the reason why we lost the battle with the Israelites is because we fought them in the mountains and their God is a God of the mountains. If we fight them in the valley, we'll win. Yeah, they obviously lost. Because God is not just a God of the mountain peaks. He's also a God of the valleys. I'm reading now from 1 Kings 20, 28. A man of God came to the king of Israel with this message. The Lord said, the people of Aram said, I, the Lord, am a God of the mountain and not a God of the valleys, so I will let you defeat this great army. Then all of you will know that I am a Lord wherever you are. Wherever you are. And you know, this, this passage does remind us that God's not just with us in our peak experiences, but he really is with us in the difficult, low valley seasons that we all experience. Psalms 34, 19 says, A good man does not escape all troubles. That means good women, too. Amen. A good man does not escape all troubles. He has them, too. But the Lord helps him. He helps him in each and every one of them. Now, valleys are very challenging, often painful, and really they're also very unpredictable because you never know when a valley's going to come, and usually it comes at the worst possible time. Have you noticed that? Oh, yes. When you're the least prepared, I would like to schedule my, value, my valleys. You would, wouldn't you like to schedule them, you know? When, you know, you're, you got your, caught up on your rest, 
your health's pretty good, your, your workload is manageable, and the EGRs, you know what the EGRs are, right? Yes. The extra grace required people, they're safely in the background. Yeah, now I'll have my valley, thank you very much, but it doesn't work that way, does it? We don't get to pick and choose when our valleys are going to come, and they come at the worst possible time, whether we are ready for it or not. So then how, how do we walk through valleys? Well, we're going to look at three different valley experiences in scriptures, and I think that each of these will help us navigate our own valleys with God's help. And the first one is one that we're all very familiar with, and that is the Valley of Dry Bones. We're all familiar with that. Uh, Ezekiel 37, 1 and 2, The Lord's power came on me. The Spirit of the Lord carried me out of the city and put me down in the middle of the valley. The valley was full of dead man's bones. There were many bones lying around on the ground in the valley. And the Lord made me walk around among the bones. And I saw the bones were very dry. So here's Ezekiel. He's standing at, in the valley in a, in a field. And there's dry, dusty old bones everywhere. And God asks him the question, can these bones live? Well, it's looking like a definite no. But he's not going to voice his doubt. So he very, Ezekiel very diplomatically says, "Uh, Lord, uh, only you know the answer to that question. But then God just jumps to his whole point. And he said to Ezekiel, you know, I want you to speak to these dry bones and tell them, This is what the Lord says. I'm reading from Ezekiel 37, 5, and 6 now. I will cause breath to come into you, and you will come to life. I will cause breath. Oh, that's so awesome. Put sinew and muscles on you, and I will cover you uh, with skin, and then I'll put breath in you, and you will come back to life, and then you will know that I am the Lord. So... Ezekiel did exactly that. He spoke on behalf of the Lord. And as he did, a great noise came about as bone joined with other bones. You know, the ankle bone connected to the leg bone, the leg bone connected to the knee bone, the knee. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. So there's this huge noise as all the bones are coming together. And then Ezekiel saw them getting covered with muscle and then with skin. But they just laid there because they were, they were dead. There's no life in them. So then God spoke. And told, told Elijah to command the wind. Command the wind to come and blow into these bodies and they will live. So Ezekiel obeyed. And breath came into all these bodies. And they stood up, and it was a very, very large army of men standing there, men that were just literally dry bones, but now they're a living army. How amazing is that? If you didn't have so much turkey and gravy, you would think it's amazing too. Yeah, I mean, it's so amazing. But you know what's really, really powerful? I mean, to me... The best part is when God then said, he announced after all of this, that although his people felt dried up and their hope was gone, that he was going to put his spirit in them and bring new life to them. That was the powerful word that came out of the valley of dry bones. It was powerful for them then but it's also powerful for us now because that's what God wants to do, you know? So, so what, what's the Valley of Dry Bones like in our lives? I, we, I just read the story of what it was like in Ezekiel's day, but what's, what's the Valley of Dry Bones look like in our lives? So, well, it, if, I think it, 
It feels like God is a thousand miles away, and faith is a real struggle, and prayer seems more like a chore than a joy. So in a single simple word, dry. That's what the Valley of Dry Bones looks like in our lives. We're, we're dry. You know, I, I love it. There are times when I can say, hello, Jesus, and he says hi right back. Oh, I love it. I can close my eyes and I can just sense his presence. And honestly, I wish it was like that all the time. But it's not. It's not like that all the time. Sometimes God feels a thousand miles away. How, you know what? You're all acting really religious right now. But can we have just a moment of vulnerability and transparency? How many of you have ever been in that place where God feels a thousand miles away? Could you raise your hands? See, people, we all feel that. We all feel that when God is a thousand miles away. I think that's what David was actually feeling when he wrote these words in Psalm 63 and 1. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where no water is. I think David was in one of those places when he wrote those words. But the good news is, it all sounds like bad news up to this point, but, you know, there is good news. And the good news is that God is with us in the valleys, even when it doesn't feel like he is. He is there in the valleys. And even when you feel dry inside and you don't feel like you have any hope, God is there with you. And he wants to bring life back into you just like he wanted to bring life into the children of Israel. That's his desire. I love Isaiah 41 and 10. Fear not. Ah, Fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. Oh, that's such a powerful verse. And I love this verse. But you got to keep in mind that when God set up this whole thing, he created it as a partnership with man. Now, we got to keep this in mind. Because we have to do what we can do so that God then can do what only he can do. But it's not just, oh, God, you take it. No. It's a partnership. It's a partnership. And what we can do in the valley where we're dry is we can stand with conviction. Now, conviction is, you know, you believe, you know, you know. Everybody say, you know. you know. Yeah. It's a firmly held belief. It's being certain of something. So my question to you right now today is, what do you know? What are you certain of? Not what you're feeling. But what is it that you know, that you know, that you know about God? Because that's what we have to do. We have to stand with conviction and speak what we know is true of God. You know, speak the truth. And I'm telling you, it's not easy, but valleys are a test of our faith. They're not meant to destroy us, but they are a test of our faith. So we need to stand with conviction about what we know of God is true, whether we feel it or not. And chances are, if you have a valley of dry bones, you don't feel it anyways. But I'm saying that it doesn't matter. Even if you don't feel it, you have to stand with conviction and and conviction and speak what you know God is telling you to do. Now, you can tell God something like this. I advocate being real with God. 
But you can say something like, God, I know that you're with me in this valley. Now, I don't see you in the circumstances. I don't feel your presence. Frankly, I'm not getting anything out of your word. But I know that 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 I know you are here in this valley with me. That's what we have to do when we're in a place of dryness. We have to speak what we know is true. And, and just not speaking uh, what we know to be true, but speak life into your circumstances, just like Ezekiel spoke life into those dry bones. Speak life. You know, Scripture tells us that our words have power, right? How many times have we heard that? A couple thousand times our words have power. So we got to speak. Not what we're feeling. Not complaining, not grumbling, not crying, not whining. We need to speak the truth of God's word. Speak to our dry souls. Speak to the dryness in our relationships, in our marriage, with our children. Maybe speak to the dryness of our, our dreams that have, have just died. Speak to our Careers speak to our ministries. I'm saying that we got to get up and start talking right. Yeah. We got to start speaking right, even we don't feel like it. You see, if you're feeling like it, well, that's not faith, is it? Because you're just, you're feeling it anyways. But when you're in that dry place in your soul. And you speak to your circumstances what you know from God's word is true. You may not feel it right now, but you know that you know that you know that you know. That's what you do in the valleys. You speak God's word over your situations that seem dead, that seem without hope. You speak God's word to the situations with conviction. Did you hear me? What, what did I say? Speak it with conviction. conviction. You have to speak what you know. It's not just quoting scriptures blindly, hoping that it'll work. It's speaking what you know to be true. And that will bring life in your valley of dry bones. Now, there and there's the valley, number two of Elah. I'm reading 1 Samuel chapter number 17, verses 2 and 3. Saul's soldiers were lined up and ready to fight the Philistines. The Philistines were on the hill, and the Israelites were on the other hill, and a valley was between them. Now, that was the valley of Elah. And God, Goliath, we all know this story, but Goliath would come out daily into the valley, and he would taunt and he would challenge the Israelites to some kind of duel, you know. Uh, you pick a champion to fight me. And if I win, y'all are our slaves. Philistines, slaves. But if you win, well, then we'll be your slaves. But the problem was Goliath was huge. I mean, he was a big guy. Who is the biggest guy here? You are not the biggest guy here. <laughs> the biggest guy here, Pastor Asa. <laughs> yeah, but see, here's the thing. The biggest guy here is nowhere near Goliath. Goliath was so big and his muscle mass was so big that the Israelites were absolutely terrified of him. The king down to the seasoned soldiers. They were all terrified. They were scared stiff, except for young David, who was actually in the army camp on a grub hub run. <laughs> you know, from, from his dad to his brothers. And when he heard those taunts, he was infuriated. 
So he wanted to do something about it, but you, nobody wanted him, him, yeah, young guy, to, to do anything. That's what he fought. He fought for it until finally he was given permission to go out and face this giant. He went and he took five of those smooth stones, put it in his bucket, and put his sling in his hand and walked out to meet the giant. Now, Goliath has been taunting them for some time, asking for a champion. And what comes out to him uh, doesn't look like a champion. It's a young boy without any armor. And Goliath looks at him and he's, he's just, he's humiliated. He's so angry. He says, am I a dog that you come out at me with a stick? So he gives David a good cussing out. And then he says, come on, boy. I'm going to make you roadkill for buzzards. Now, we know how David responded. He says, well, you come to me, sword and the spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the angel armies, the Lord of uh, Israel's troops that you have mocked and cursed this day. And the Lord is going to give you into my hands and then everyone know there's this extraordinary God in Israel. And then he ran. Not what you're thinking. He ran to Goliath. He didn't walk casually. He didn't swagger. He just ran, taking a stone out of his bag, and as he's ran, running, he put it in his sling and swung the sling, and the stone hit the giant in the middle of the forehead, and the rest is, as they say, history. Powerful thing that happened. Deuteronomy 31 and 6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. I love the worship said today because y'all were singing my sermon. I was like, okay, I don't really need to get up. Y'all just sang it. It was, it was beautiful. It was powerful. But let me just say, what is the Valley of Elah in our lives? Well, in one word, it's fear. We all have fear just like the Israelites had fear. Now, we're probably not afraid of giants, but we do have our own fears. And I'm not talking about phobias like the fear of heights or, or fear of spiders. I'm talking about fears like the fear of rejection. I want you to hear me now. The fear of failure. The fear of just not being good enough. I'm talking about the fear of the unknown or the fear of abandonment or, or just being afraid to trust people again. We have fears for our kids and fears for our parents. We have fears for our health. We have fears for our financial lack. Fear of the enemy of our souls. Let me just say this. We all have fears. Every single one of us. Again, I'm going to look for everyone who is honest and transparent. How many of you will acknowledge that, yeah, I have a fear or two? Thank you. I'm, I'm looking for some of you big guys who don't want to acknowledge it. <laughs> but we're being real. We're being transparent. And all of us have fears of some kind. But the problem is, and here's why I consider fear to be a valley experience. You know, it's not typical what you think of as a valley, but I think fear is a valley experience because fear has a truly negative impact on our thinking and our, and our decision making. It also makes us susceptible to intense emotions and, oh, uh, impulsive reactions it also paralyzes us and keeps us from moving into God's best for us. And fear, honestly, is the enemy's favorite tactic to keep you from accomplishing God's purposes. It is. Fear causes us to be stuck. And that's why I consider it a valley. 
Now, here's the thing. Even if you ask God to deliver you from your fears, he's not going to. Now I've got everybody's attention. Here's the thing. Remember, this is a partnership. We don't just pray, God, do this, God, do that, God, take care of this. No, it is a partnership that we have with God. Therefore, there are things that God will do, absolutely, but there's also things that we must do. You and me. And what he will do is give you opportunities to face your fears straight on. That's what he's going to do for you. And, and he's going to be with you every step of the way. But, but those opportunities to face your fears is the way God helps you. He gives it to you. And, and he will be with you, honestly, in the Valley of Eli as you find your courage to face your fears. Now, we all know what courage is, right? right. We've talked about it, preached about, about it so many times. Courage is doing the thing that you're afraid of doing while you're afraid of doing it. Courage is not the elimination of fear. Courage is doing it when you're afraid. And that's how we overcome fear, is when we do what we are afraid of doing. Now, why would we do that? Why would we step out and do the very thing that we're afraid of doing? We do it because there's something more important than our fear. It's right there. I've asked you all to be transparent today, so I'm going to be transparent with you. I'm afraid of the unknown. You probably maybe heard me mention this, but I, I don't even like going to a new restaurant. You too? Yeah, I'm afraid of not knowing. Oh, yeah. oh, cool. We'll talk about it afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even like to go to a new restaurant here in my hometown. Then why would I get on a plane to go to Turkey to a city I've never been with Hoping somebody that I've never met before is going to pick me up and take me to a place where there's no, there's no adequate translation. For them then to put my husband and I on a bus where nobody speaks English and says, get off at this stop. Get off at the stop. It's at night. You're looking for somebody to pick you up for 15 minutes and there's nobody there. And then somebody picks us up that we don't know. And then it goes, the next stop is the same thing. Why would I put myself through that? Because something is more important than my fears. The work of God is more important than my fears. His people around the world are more important than my fears. So I do it afraid. What is God asking you to do? Do it. Everybody tell your neighbor, just do it. This is a Nike. You do what you're afraid of doing and God will help you. Psalm 46, 1 through 3 says, God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved to the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though mountains tremble at the head. It doesn't matter if there's earthquakes and tsunamis in your backyard. Because
because God is going to give us the opportunity to do what we're afraid of doing. And when we do, he is going to be victorious. He is going to be victorious. Everybody said amen. Amen. Okay, I really need to move, I think. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, I need to move. Number three is the Valley of Agilon. And that day the Lord gave Israel a victory over the Amorites. And Joshua stood before all of Israel and said to the Lord, Son, stop over Gibeon. Moon, stand still over the Valley of Agilon. Okay. When the people of the land heard that the Gibeonites became allies with Israel, not one, not two, not three, not four, five kings joined forces and brought all of their armies against Gibeon. And the Gibeonites, they were overwhelmed. Everybody say overwhelmed. They were overwhelmed. So they sent a message to Joshua. They said, we are your servants. Come help us, hurry, save us all the Amorite kings uh, from the hill country have brought their armies together to fight us. So God, here's the thing Joshua did. Joshua went to God. God gave his thumbs up. So Joshua and his army actually marched all night long and arrived surprising the coalition army. And God confused those armies so much so that Israel was able to have just a, just defeat them decisively. They chased the coalition uh, down the road. And what happened next is really amazing. God said, huge hailstones. And the Bible says that there are more soldiers that died from the hailstorms than there actually that they died from the sword. But that's not the finish of it. Then we go back to the verse we just read in Joshua 10. I'm going to read it again. And it says, Joshua stood before all of the Israelites and said to the Lord, Son, stop over Gibeon. Moon stands still over the valley of Agilon. And it did. Oh, no, no. You guys should be going, what? Sun stood still, what? (laughs) I mean, what? Something like that never happened before, and it never happened again. God listened to a man and stopped the sun. But see, the stopping of the sun is what made it possible for Joshua to finish killing off all the enemies. Now, I was stood on the edge of the mountain looking over into that valley uh, back in November of last year. And the way the valley is uh, positioned, when Israel's troops came up over the mountain... The sun was at their back. So it blinded all the enemies. So they're coming with the sun on the back. They can see everything clearly. The, the armies can't. They're blinded. So Joshua says, just keep the sun up there. <laughs> you know, just keep it up. And not only was it blinding them, but it just gave Joshua time to finish killing absolutely everything. Every one of them. So think of it. Confusion. Hail. Sun standing still for over a day. God does all of this to use it to help defeat Israel's enemies. So let's think about it. What is the valley of Agilon like in our lives? Well, it's when you feel devastated stretched to the max, swamped. You feel like you just can't handle anymore. In one word, overwhelmed. Just like the Gibeonites, Nights, overwhelmed. Has anybody ever felt overwhelmed? I have two hands up. 
I have two hands up. That feeling of that feeling of over, being overwhelmed can be when you time pressures. You know, you got too much to do, and not enough time to do it. That can make you feel overwhelmed, or uh, decision deadlines, or perhaps you know information overload, or exhaustion, or devastating losses, or unspeakable disappointments, oh, relationship problems, and physical problems and financial problems, all of this can cause a person to feel overwhelmed. But the thing is, it's usually not just one thing, is it? Right. I think we can handle one thing, maybe two, possibly three, but it just keeps coming. Anybody know what I mean? Yeah. Just keeps coming more and more and more. Have you ever felt like, God, I just can't take it anymore. It's just too much. Have you ever felt that way? I did this week. I'm still feeling it right now. Transparency. I wasn't able to run this message by sermon planning because first I was in Turkey and the next week I was with my husband in the hospital. And so later on in the week, uh, Pastor Brent just texted me, how are you coming with the sermon? And I just texted back, how come we got to live it before we can preach it? So why I'm being transparent and honest with you here is I want you to know that I'm not standing up here preaching at you. You hearing me? I'm not saying you need to do this and you need to do that and you, no, no, no. I'm standing in the valley of being overwhelmed with you right now. And so I am speaking from my heart. I'm speaking from my life. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you what we can do when we are overwhelmed. And that is no. We got to know that God is going to fight for us. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is going to fight for you. I promise. Isaiah 41 and 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be display, dismay, dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That is so beautiful, and that is so powerful that God is with us in those valleys. And when you're feeling overwhelmed, remember that God is your strength, and he will guide you, and he will help you overcome one issue at a time. But this valley is just like the other two valleys. It's a partnership. The things that we have to do, and then God will do what only he can do. When you feel overwhelmed, bring all your challenges and all your emotional overload and cast them at the feet of Jesus, and then let him guide you as you take one step at a time. You take one step at a time like he guides. It'll also help if you get your mind off of feeling overwhelmed, you know. Take a walk, clear your head, talk to a friend about it. I'll tell you what really helps, refocusing with prayer, the word, and worship. But here's what I want you to know. It's just, it's going to be one step at a time. It's not going to be a miracle, it's gone. It's going to be one step at a time that'll help you get to the place where you're not feeling overwhelmed anymore. And here's the reason, it's a feeling. Being overwhelmed is a feeling. And you can replace that feeling with trust in God that he is gonna help you get through this season one step at a time. 
How you get through being overwhelmed is just having confidence in God that he is the one that is going to help you through this valley, even though things keep coming and you say, okay, I can't take anymore. And then what happens? More comes. It's like, okay, but I trust you, God. I trust you, God. I have confidence because you're right here in this valley with me. And you're going to walk with me and you're going to guide me one step at a time. And we're going to come out of this valley together. You see, valleys, valleys are not there to defeat us. Valleys are here as a test of our faith. So the question you need to ask yourself, am I going to pass this test? Now, I was one of those nerdy kids. Anybody else was a nerd? Not very many of you. Oh, I feel so alone. I was a nerdy kid, so when I had a test, I made sure I was going to pass that thing. I studied and studied and studied till I passed it. And so this week, when I've been going through so much, and I was studying and preparing this sermon, I thought, this is a test. What does Chris McQuaid do with tests? I pass them. I pass tests. That's what Chris McQuaid does and that's what you do if you will just take it one step at a time and allow God to guide you and comfort you and strengthen you and keep you in the midst of the valley just as we close now we're closing but did you notice what happened in every single one of those valleys Think back. What happened? Oh, there were miracles. Seriously. Son standing still? That's a miracle. A young boy running towards a giant full speed, swinging and hitting a giant right in the one spot that doesn't have armor. That's God. That's a miracle. Bones standing up and breathing again. That's a miracle. You see, your valleys are not there to defeat you. Your valleys are there to release miracles into your lives. Valleys are miracle territories. And as I was praying about this message and saying, God, this is like the worst possible time for me to be preaching. Have you ever complained to God? Okay. Yeah, I was complaining. It's like, God, God, I this is the worst possible time. But then you know what God said? He said, yeah, but I'm going to release miracles. So God's going to release miracles. Asher, you talked about miracles today. You talked that it was. So I truly believe that God is going to produce a miracle, not to get you out of valley, but he's just going to give you a miracle in the valley. He's going to give you a miracle in the valley. So if you are in a miracle situation right now, and you need a miracle, I want you to stand up right now. If you need a miracle, amen. As they play, as they play, there you go. Are all of you in valleys right now? See, that's why God wanted this message. As they play, I want you to don't do it yet but I want you to raise your hands I want you first of all tell God I trust you in this valley 
no, no, wait, wait, wait. I don't, this is going to be a personal thing, okay? It's not going to be repeat after me. But I want you to raise your hands and I want you to say, God, I trust you in this valley. And I know that you're going to get me through it. And I also know that you are going to do miracle on my behalf. So I receive that miracle right now. This is what I want you to pray. Everyone to yourself. I'm going to be leading in a prayer over you. But I just, I truly believe with all of my heart that God is going to release miracles right now. So I want you to do that. I want you just to tell God, God, I trust you in this valley. I know that you're standing right here beside me. That you're going to get me through this. But I also know that you're going to release miracles into my life because that's just what you do. You are a miracle working God who works miracles in valleys. So right now I receive my miracle in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to state the miracle that God, you want God to perform, whether it's for your family or for your health or your finances, whatever it is, I want you to declare it right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we release your miracle working power. The power that, that is here because of your shed blood on Calvary. And power because of your name. Power because that's just who you are. We release miracles right now in Jesus' name. I want you to say, I take it, I take it, I take it, I take it. Receive it right now in Jesus' name. Don't just stand there and pray for one. Take it, take it, take it, take it. Receive it in Jesus' name. Let's clap our hands in thanksgiving to God for the miracles that He is doing right now. Right now. Right now. Amen. Amen. Pastor Chris called for the biggest guy to, 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 to uh, represent. It definitely wasn't me. But it gave me the courage because David was a small guy. And with this message, I feel like giant hunting after this message. Pastor Chris, thank you so much for preaching from your heart. Could you all join me really quick as we lift Pastor Chris up? Heavenly Father, we know that our pastor is going through a valley, but Lord, just as she declared, you are with her. So we pray that not only would we experience miracles, but out of an overflow, she would experience a miracle. Today, be with her, strengthen her with your mighty, righteous right hand. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Well, Brent, if you need anybody to preach from a mountaintop, because God is gonna use that message for me to go through a mountaintop, I wanna volunteer for next week. Mountaintop, mountaintop message. I want to invite anybody that would like prayer to come up at this time. Our prayer team would like to pray with you. If there's anything that you're currently go, going through, our prayer team like, would like to agree with you. And if you're here for the first time, I'd like to ask you to meet our team up at the loft. The loft is this raised area on the right-hand side. We have a, a, a gift that we'd like to put in your hands. In there is included as a gift from our Hope Cafe. For everybody else, could you lift up your hands? I'm going to pray a blessing over you. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. See you next week.